BYU is number 14 out of 14 teams in the Big 12. Well, at least one advanced analytic thinks BYU is the bottom of the Big 12. Let's examine that. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? I'm Jay Catch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys consuming the podcast, however you choose to do so, whether you're watching us on YouTube, downloading us wherever you get your podcasts, and otherwise, thank you, as always, for your support. We're very proud to be part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Motto around these parts is your team every day, and as such, this is your only daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. Today's title sponsors are friends over at FanDuel. This episode of Locked On Cougars is brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. All right, let's dive right in and talk some BYU football. And uh, Bill Connolly is a guy that I respect. I've got mad respect for this guy. He has spent years and years and years in the advanced analytics realm of college football, trying to essentially break down football from a scientific perspective, using different numbers to put together formulas. And he has a, an interesting formula that he calls the SP plus. And what it is, is it is a tempo and opponent adjusted measure of college football efficiency. So what it is, it's a predictive measure of the most sustainable and predictable aspects of football, not a resume ranking. And along those same lines, these projections are not intended to be a guess at what the AP top 25 will be at the end of the year. All it is, according to him, these are simply early off-season power rankings based on the information we have been able to gather. Now, he goes through recent history, he has re recruiting in there, and also returning production. And amongst the Big 12, well, it doesn't look good if you're just looking at the simple numbers uh, of the rankings for the Big 12 squads. The top dog, according to these early season metrics from SP Plus and Bill Connolly, has Texas at number nine as the top-rated Big 12 team. Now, they're the team most people think is the odds-on favorite going into the season to lead the Big 12 this year. Oklahoma at 14, TCU at 19, uh, Kansas State at 22. Those are the four inside the top 25 if you want to go by that. Then you have a bunch of teams bunched up uh, in the 30s. 34, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, 30. 35, Baylor 38, UCF 39. Well, where's BYU, you're wondering? BYU checks in at number 62, my friends. And number 62 in this rating has BYU number 14 out of 14 teams in the Big 12 Conference. Now, uh, two big reasons for that, obviously, are BYU with the returning production. Last year, they were among the nation's tops in returning production. I think they were had like 97% of their production returning. Now, it didn't necessarily work out that that production had the type of year you would have expected with it being an 8-5 and five year, but they have, they're kind of middle of the pack this year in returning production. And also, BYU's recent recruiting rankings, uh, they have been 82nd in 2020, 70th in 2021, 57th in 2022, and 50, uh, 57th in 2022, and 52nd, 52, 52nd in 2023. So the recruiting's on a trend upwards, but they have some relatively low rankings recently. That's obviously going to hurt BYU in this ranking. The closest one to BYU is actually their first Big 12 opponent, the Kansas Jayhawks at number 57. Now, as Bill Connolly uh, said early on, don't think that this is the end-all be-all and he thinks that BYU is going to be the dregs of the Big 12 Conference. Uh, I, for one, think that BYU, honestly, you have Cincinnati 43, Iowa State 45, West Virginia 50, Houston 51, 57, Kansas. I, if you were to ask me today, paper on paper, uh, looking at the lineups for both for those teams, I would pick BYU as a favorite over every single one of those teams. That's five of the teams in front of them. I think BYU is a better program, but this, like I said, it's, a pre it's simply a predictive analytic trying to project how uh, things would, would shape up. BYU, according to this S SP Plus ranking, is an, going to be an underdog in 10 of their 12 games this year, all 10 of them being their Power 5 opponents. Uh, Sam Houston State, which will be a first-year member of the FBS ranks this year, checks in at number 124, whereas Southern Utah does not measure up in these rankings because it's only an FBS analytic. So uh, very interesting stuff all the 
way around, but BYU, I think, is going to be better than that predictive analytic. Now, also, Bill Connolly said that he is going to reevaluate this both in May and August after the uh, secondary, uh, uh, what do you call it, the transfer portal window opens and closes in early to mid-May. It's May 1st through the 15th. He'll evaluate after that as he tries to evaluate transfers and their impact coming into the programs, and then also again in August heading into the season. There's no reason that BYU can't move up or down this list. I would assume up a little bit uh, based on their transfer imports of both via the early, uh, not early, but the the original um, transfer portal period after the season ended. And if they do some work in that May period, that obviously could have an impact as well. So I wouldn't be too overreactionary to this, but it is mildly concerning to look at BYU and be like, Wow, out of 14 teams, the Cougars are number 14. But uh, if you want to look at a glass half full positive style, there's only one way to go up, my friends. And that there's only one way to go, my friends. I, I buried the lead. Uh, the only one way to go, and it's to go up because you can't get any lower than 14th out of 14 teams in a conference. But nonetheless, uh, you look at this, and I think it's a big opportunity for BYU all the same going into this year. Going to still be relatively low expectations for the Cougars like the other new members of the Big 12, all things uh, considered as they will be new members of the Big 12 Conference. We had a resident UCF Night fan reach out on YouTube and said that he thinks that UCF 6-6 six and six is what he's aiming for in their first year of membership in the Big 12. So I, I, I think this is a, a fairly decent representation of where BYU stands right now. But like I said, I would assume, and just not my thing, I think the five teams in front of them, I would pick BYU head-to-head over those five teams. Now, you get up to where like UCF is, et cetera, that gets to be a little more daunting. But we're going to find out a lot about this squad and where BYU stands as a program this fall, obviously. We're, we're all going to be sitting back and watching and seeing where BYU measures up. And maybe, just maybe, they are truly going to be the 14th out of 14 teams. But I think that they can be just a little bit better than that. We'll we'll find out. All right. It is your guys' time to shine here on a Wednesday. I am actually going to be headed out on vacation on Thursday and Friday. So I'm going to move up the mailbag edition of the podcast to today's show, a Wednesday show. I reached out on social media, got a number of great questions that were sent in. We'll get to as many of them as we can fit in here in just a moment. First, a word on our friends over at FanDuel. Of course, FanDuel's been working with us for quite a while now. The midway point of the NBA season is here, my friends. The All-Star Game is this coming weekend. Now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers will get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in free bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Think about that. It's a fantastic way uh, to get some uh, free money to play around with. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores, and threes drained amongst many other options. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a bigger chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. You think you know three or four things about an individual game like the All-Star game this weekend? Parlay them all together and get a huge payout if you can hit on all of those in our with our friends over at FanDuel. So do not miss out on the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets back when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Once again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more now. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official boards, uh, excuse me, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thank you once again for checking out Locked On Cougars and joining us here on your only daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. I want to encourage you guys to make sure you check out our brand new podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network, Locked On College Basketball. Been going for probably a couple months now, and they're doing a great job. It's got everything you need to know about the college hoops realm in one place here from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players alike. That's Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about what you guys want to talk about. It's your time to shine. Uh, reaching out via social media. Thank you for all of your questions this week. I uh, will start off with this one uh, coming in from BYU Gal at, at Cougar underscore Badger. She asked this, gun to your head. Does the Pac-12 stay together in the short term? If you're asking me if they th- stay together in the next for the next five years, I would say they do. I just think with the expanded playoff coming, there are going to be uh, opportunities for that conference, no matter how degraded it might be, for them still to have the automatic bid into the college football playoff as one of the top six seeds. So uh, a program like Utah, they're going to probably make their bed with the with the Pac-12, Pac-10, whatever it's going to be, and bet on their opportunities to make the college football playoff from that realm, rather than having to jump into a Big 12 where they might be a little more hard-pressed to rise to the top of that conference with some of the other established programs. So gun to my head, I do think the Pac-12 sticks together, at least for now. But everything right now going on, it's a very tenuous spot for the Pac-12 to be in. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And they've got to make sure that they figure things out on their media rights deal or 
you're going to have programs that are going to get it real jumpy all of a sudden and start really considering what their future is going to be in the college ranks. Now, Nick Lee added, asked a similar question, says, tell me why I should care about Utah possibly needing to jump into the Big 12. I say let them rot wherever they end up if the Pac-12 dissolves or becomes the Mountain West 2.0. Now, Nick, uh, you can find Nick at Nick Lee 51 He's, of course, a host of Locked on Seahawks. If you're a Seattle Seahawks fan, it's a great podcast. And Nick's got, a, I think, a sentiment that a lot of BYU fans share. The, the the rivalry has existed in so many facets for so long that if it were to come to it where Utah needed a lifeboat, I'm not 100% convinced that BYU would essentially say, screw you. I, I don't think necessarily they'd do that. But BYU is always going to act in their best interest. I think they learned a hard lesson the last time this all went down with conference realignment. And BYU is going to look out for number one. They're looking out for themselves. If that involves Utah potentially being helped, They'll have to make that decision when it comes, but it's always got to be it. BYU's mindset in this circumstance, whatever it might be, is got to be look out for BYU first and foremost, and everybody else is secondary in this instance. Keith Wilson asked this at the real Keith on Twitter says, which Pac-12 schools are the best fit for poaching to the Big 12? Now, Jeff Hansen from uh, Give Him Help Brigham, the podcast, wrote a really cool uh, article recently. We actually advocated for Washington State to be the linchpin for BYU and the Big 12 to consider going after because they are a program that gets completely overlooked. Most people think if the Pac-12 dissolves, Washington State is nothing better, uh, just not going to do any better than getting into the Mountain West Conference. But if you could destabilize the league, why not go grab Washington State? And if you wanted to truly get uh, Spokane and the the kind of the Eastern Washington realm with Gonzaga into the conference, well, there's your travel, travel partner with Wazoo coming in alongside Gonzaga, even if Gonzaga is only a basketball only member it's a very interesting concept but i think uh, in my pantheon or my power ratings of the top teams you would want to get if you're the big 12 number one is washington number two is oregon those are the top two dogs the next ones are the arizona schools for me arizona and arizona state then you come to the intermountain west i think you've got utah and colorado on that list after that and then after that cal stanford washington state oregon state I know that the Bay Area in theory comes with Cal and Stanford, but they seem like have to have zero interest in downgrading to the Big 12 Conference. They're a little snooty out there, as you can tell. But that's probably where I would rate it, honestly, Keith. That's probably where I would have things. All right, next question coming in. Spencer Bryan at SE Bryan 14 asking a question I've answered a few times, but I'm happy to answer it again. As far as the strength and conditioning staff goes, are they set or are others being brought in? Now, I can say that they are set for the time being because what I understand and the way that it was described uh, to me, and we had Chad Lewis on the KSL Sports Zone, the radio station I work for here in Salt Lake City, 97.5 FM and 1280 AM. He mentioned that Spencer Reed, who is the son of Kansas City Chiefs head coach Andy Reed, he is running the day-to-day operations as the director of strength and conditioning. So he's the guy in the weight room every day working with BYU's players. But you have Dr. Skyler Main working alongside him, trying to help him out, obviously. And I think Dr. Skyler Main actually is probably the head honcho running everything. He's kind of like the top of the pyramid in that realm. Whereas uh, Spencer Reed might be taking his orders from Skyler Main and implementing on a implementing them on a day to day basis in the weight room. Dr. Main does maintain a practice outside of BYU. He's officially a consultant with the BYU football program and does a lot of training on the side. But he is a very very bright individual. We had another question sent in. I, I lost the DM on this and somebody asked me, well, Jake, what's up with Colby Clawson? You wanted to hear updates on former Cougars. He said he thought he thought that Colby Clawson was a dentist. Well, Colby Clawson is actually working at BYU. He works with Dr. Skyler Maine as a member of BYU sports science department. So he's working with Dr. Maine and implementing the overall sports science uh, goals for BYU's football players. And Clawson is a guy who's got his own high level. I think he's a PhD as well. If not, he's got a master's degree at minimum to do the job that he is doing. So Colby Clawson is actually back in the program. And like I said, I apologize. I lost that DM somewhere. I might have accidentally deleted it, but I remember that question came in kind of wanting updates on former Cougars like Colby. He's actually back in the program, and he's actually working on a day-to-day basis with BYU uh, football players. All right, uh, other questions coming in here. Daniel Rigby, some BYU fans hating on Pope. What do you think Pope's? Uh, what do you think a coach's? Uh, let's start over. Daniel Rigby, at please don't cheese on Twitter says some BYU fans are hating on Pope. What do you think of Pope's coaching performance this season? Also, would you want Utah in the Big Twelve if that scenario arises? I already addressed that one. It says a resounding yes for me though. This is interesting from Daniel. It says a resounding yes for me, but seen some posts on social media saying otherwise from BYU fans. I think you can understand. I think it's a pretty uh, 
lightning rod type topic. But your original question, some BYU fans are hating on Mark Pope. What do you think of Pope's, what do, what do I think of Mark Pope's coaching job this season? I would give it a, a decent B minus, I would say. Uh, he obviously has to answer for BYU's lackluster record. I read the article in the Deseret News that BYU is tracking for their worst conference record in 18 years. It has been a long time since BYU has been this poor in basketball. You have to go back to that 2005 season, the final season of Steve Cleveland's tenure before he jumped to Fresno State when BYU slumped to a 9-21 and record to find a conference record that's as bad or tracking as bad as BYU is right now. So I don't think I could give him any higher than a B-. minus. I'd probably actually probably give him like a C or a C plus if I'm being honest. But if he finishes up the season strong here, you got big opportunities in the final three regular season games. If you can get hot in March and win the first conference title, uh, in the conference championship title in 20 ish years is 20 actually more than 20 years now. It's a crazy thing. I think it's 2001. Is it 22 years since they last won a conference uh, championship? But nonetheless, if you can do that, that'll raise your grade significantly. But he has not been necessarily as good as I thought he was, but he's also not been as bad as people want to put him on blast for out there in social media. All right. Other questions coming in. Brendan Smith at Top Gun Brendan saying, Jake, BYU TV really grew and became more prominent during the independence era. What do you think of the Big 12 era will do to BYU TV, especially in its sports broadcasting? Now, I can't answer this completely because I'm not on the inside, Brendan. But what I understand in hearing some of the chatter from BYU TV folks like Jerem Jordan and Spencer Linton on social media is that they will continue to have a role in this. A lot of the Big 12's uh, third-tier stuff, so the stuff that BYU TV had always picked up in the past, women's basketball games, softball, all that stuff. That stuff's going to be going to ESPN Plus and streaming partners slash uh, – other uh, platforms for the Big 12 in the future. But BYU TV will play a big role in producing those games and helping getting them on air. So, yeah, they may not ultimately carry as much on BYU TV, if anything at all, but they will have a big role in helping BYU sports wherever they're going to be seen, whether it's on ESPN Plus streaming or other networks slash streaming platforms. BYU TV will have a big role in that is what I understand, Brendan. So hopefully I can help you understand a little bit about where things stand there. Now, other questions. Uh, Garrett asked a question that is similar. Uh, actually, it's not similar. It's one that he actually asked, asked week, last week, and I apologize that I did not get to this, Garrett, but you actually you, you reminded me of it by sending in the question again. It says, BYU's team defense was noticeably slow against teams like Oregon, Arkansas, and even East Carolina at times. It says, Big 12 offenses are known for fast and athletic offenses that score a lot of points in a hurry. What can BYU's defense do to better prepare themselves for these types of offenses each week? Honestly, uh, we're going to find out together because I think Jay Hill has a plan for what he th- sees BYU's defense ultimately becoming under his direction as BYU's defensive coordinator. My question is, does he have all the horses he needs to run that defense effectively in year one? I would anticipate the answer is no, but Jay Hill is a crafty enough coach, a guy that I trust to implement a, a system slash a philosophy that is going to maximize BYU's defensive strengths this season. If they have a good pass rush, he's going to throw everything at keeping quarterbacks uh, on their toes and bouncing around, trying to destabilize them from that point. If it feels like he's got a better secondary, obviously he'll lean on those guys to go out and go man-on-man coverage. If he feels like he needs to blitz more, he will do that. The one thing I know about Jay is he is not going to sit idly by like certain other defensive coaches recently and let it be death by a thousand paper cuts. He has talked about that. He said, I refuse to let that happen. I will not let a team continue to run it down our throat and not do anything to stop it and stick with our philosophy. It was what we had going in. It was what we're sticking with all game long. You have got to adjust. And Jay Hill, he will adjust on the fly. He learned that from Kyle Whittingham. There is no more of the passive defense that BYU has shown the past two years in particular that is going to be accepted at BYU. Kalani Satake got fed up with it and obviously made the moves that he did this offseason. Jay Hill will have those guys play as well as he possibly can make them. Like I said, Will it be the system that he envisions being 100% this year? I highly doubt that. But it'll be glimpses of what is coming for BYU down the pipe. Now, uh, we've got a few more questions here. Let's, let's pound these out real quick. Our good friend Wild Turkey Fart Blunt VWAG23 on Twitter says, for the 2024 signing class, what does the big board at QB look like right now? And who is BYU going after the hardest? Uh, right now, Luke Moga out of the Sunny Slope High School down there in Arizona, he apparently has been just interacting with BYU on a huge basis 
on social media. He is one of the legit fastest quarterbacks I have ever seen on tape. He's got just pure unadulterated track speed. I think somebody said it was in the 10, five range in the hundred meter dash dude can absolutely fly. He's a guy that BYU is recruiting in 2024. Isaac Wilson is obviously going to be a top BYU's wish list. I feel like, because obviously the Wilson family legacy and him being a quarterback who has been very, very good for quite a while there at corner Canyon high school. I think that BYU believes in his ability, but, he seems like a guy that uh, may have eyes elsewhere. Just my perception of how things are going for him. We'll find out. He's a very private uh, guy. He's actually more like his uh, brother, Zach, in the fact that he doesn't necessarily use social media a lot outside of announcing offers out there. I think those are probably two of the guys at the top BYU's wish, uh, wish list, I guess, for quarterback. There are other guys out there, though. The, the 2024 class has got quite a few quarterbacks. I can think of TC Manamaleuna up there in, in Oregon or in was in Oregon. Yeah, he went to the Oregon game this year. He's not necessarily the tallest quarterback for BYU, but he's got an ability to really sling the rock. And could he could it end up that he plays a different position if he were to pick BYU? Maybe so. But the biggest thing I think for BYU with regards to what they're doing uh, quarterback-wise in the 2024 class is they're trying to make sure that they shore up every position they possibly can. And that's the thing about this is you, you look at how things are trending for BYU. They're a member of the Big 12. They're going to chase big names, and they have they are unafraid of throwing their hat into the ring with any of these young men, and that, that should excite you as a Cougar fan because he's got the hope of really uh, being – well, not he, but, but speaking of BYU, they have the hope of being a top-level program and recruiting among the nation's best. They also have an offer out to – I had to look this up. My A.L. Leo, Leo Aki Smith out of Junipero Serra, J. Serra High School down there in San Mateo, California. He's a high-level three-star prospect. He's also got an offer from BYU. So those are probably the four guys right now, but there's always a chance that a guy or two pops up along the way here in the recruiting uh, cycle. But if I were to – you want me to handicap it, I think it's probably Luke Moga 1A. And Isaac Wilson, 1B, those are probably your top two targets, at least from my perception. I'm going to have to ask Jeff Hansen from Cougar Sports Insider for a little help on that probably. He's, he's of course, the recruiting guru out there doing great stuff on that front. All right. Uh, let's see. Got a few more questions here. Uh, we'll get to those. I also need to talk about one of the great individual performances in BYU football history in a bowl game. That comes, of course, via Kyle Van Nuys. Our look back at all 155 BYU football games in their independent uh, run. Uh, as we continue that on, we'll talk about all of those here in just a moment. Today's show, though, is brought to you by our friends over at UCCU. At UCCU, love where you bank is a promise, my friends, made by a local not-for-profit financial institution, which is dedicated to helping fam families improve their financial lives. UCCU delivers on that promise. They pioneer new technologies that make banking safer, easier, and more convenient. They cre create new products and services that add real value to their members. I can attest to that because I continue to use their services every single day. The best part is they also provide easy access to real local human beings who always give personal help or assistance where they might need it. There are many reasons to love banking with UCCU. And of course, the best way to know why you'll love banking at UCCU is to experience it for yourself. I've told you guys before, and I'll tell you guys again, I have been working with UCCU as my primary financial institution for 30 years of my 36 on this planet. I absolutely love uh, UCCU. They do it right. But I'm not the only one who's saying that. Floyd Cave Nephi shares, UCCU is the best at what a, and what a banking institution should be about. They actually care about their members and go above and beyond to get you what you really need. They are the best. Trust Floyd. Trust my recommendation. Check out UCCU. Love where you bank. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. You guys are absolutely phenomenal. I, I cannot thank you guys enough. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to go on a little bit of a vacation. I spent some time with my wife down in Southern Cal California uh, for a few days. But don't fear. I've actually got podcasts uh, queued up for you guys both Thursday and Friday. So we will not leave you guys empty-handed. Now, inevitably, it feels like my wife has a joke that whenever I go on vacation, crazy thing happens. Crazy things happen in the sports world. If something does happen while I'm gone, I will do my best to react to it live time on social media, maybe get a, a quick post up if I can. But also, uh, we'll have a full recap for you guys, whatever happens on Monday. Just a little bit of a heads up on that. All right, a couple of questions uh, we need to answer before we uh, wrap up today's show coming in on social media still. Uh, one coming in from Texas Conservative, and I apologize I didn't get to this one last week. I, for some reason, my DMs on the Locked On Cougars feed were not working, uh, it feels like, for a hot minute there. It says, hey, Jake, living down here in Texas, are there any ideas as to the best ways to get great tickets to some of these choice games close to my home in North Texas? OSU, speaking of Oklahoma State, TCU, Texas, and even Kansas. 
I feel like a kid in a candy store, exclamation points. Now, uh, Texas conservative at T Carpenter 37, uh, the biggest thing for you is if you're a member of the Cougar Club, you can get tickets that way, but also just keep an eye out. Uh, these Big 12 programs, they are obviously going to have opportunities to get single game tickets, and it's probably your best bet. The secondary market will always be an option for you, but there are markups on those tickets, fees, uh, the sellers themselves marking them up. Keep an eye on that, but it is an opportunity to get out to the games just by kind of using different connections you might have, whether it's the Cougar Club on the BYU side, paying attention when these schools announce single game tickets. Go take advantage of it, and yes, make the trip if you can. Go support uh, BYU football any which way you possibly can do that. One final question coming in from Casey Finlinson. He, he asked this, is it more a mental or physical slash lack of talent issue that is keeping BYU basketball from winning on the road against the top teams in the West Coast Conference? That's an interesting question there because BYU has had some fairly decent athletes during their time in the West Coast Conference. You can think of Eric Mika. You can think of guys like TJ Hawes, Jake Toulson, Yoli Childs. Man, on down the list. They've had some really good teams. But they have, like, like he mentions, uh, Casey mentions, they have had consistently inopportune times where they've struggled on the road against the top dogs, speaking of St. Mary's and Gonzaga, most notably, but they also fall in flat against seemingly every other program in the conference. You can think of different games that like Portland upset them in triple overtime. If you recall, uh, uh, was that five or six years ago, losing to Pepperdine this year, BYU on the road, it feels like it is a kind of a mental thing. And there is a, there is a component of going on the road that you're not uh, familiar with the lay of the land. You're battling against a hostile crowd, even though hostile crowd in the West coast conference, uh, sounds like an oxymoron because BYU fans have outnumbered opposing uh, the home crowds in almost every single venue every time I've happened to tune into these games. But nonetheless, playing on the road is much different than playing at home. And especially with young teams, as Mark Pope will tell you, this is a young team. Coach, you're almost 30 games into the season. The whole we're young thing, it's wearing thin. At this point, guys have got to man up mentally. They have got to lock in. That's the thing about this. I want to see this team. I mentioned it earlier this week on the podcast on our Monday edition saying the biggest thing for BYU to rebound from losses against Pepperdine and Gonzaga is to go out, out on the road to a program like St. Mary's this Saturday in Moraga, maybe the toughest venue you have played during your 12 years as a member of the WCC. Go and win there. That would prove to me that you have grown up as a program and the young guys, that, that young mentality is no longer a thing for BYU. That's what I want to see. So hopefully that answers your question, Casey. It's, it's an interesting uh, query. And I appreciate, by the way, all of you reaching out. Now, final thing before we go on today's show is a look back at the final game of the 2012 season. We officially uh, completed two seasons of BYU football, 26 of the 155 games BYU played as an independent pro football program. And number 26 was played down in San Diego uh, in the San Diego County Credit Union Poinsettia Bowl. Now, uh, this was a game that James Lark came in uh, starting for the second straight game. Of course, he had absolutely just dominated New Mexico State. Well, uh, in this game, he came out and showed more of why James Lark was a career backup by and large for BYU. Two interceptions, struggled across the board, but Kyle Van Noy said, enough of this. You guys aren't going to score. I'll do it myself. In the fourth quarter, Kyle Van Noy scored two touchdowns on turnovers, one of them a pick six, another one a fumble uh, recovery for a touchdown, and he absolutely single-handedly won this game. It is very hard for a, for a defensive player to impact a game as much as Kyle Van Noy did in this instance, but he absolutely won this game for BYU. Uh, it was just incredible. Van Noy was an absolute legend to BYU, remains a legend to BYU, and he is the single reason why BYU finished the 2012 season 8-5. and five. They were on their way to finishing 7-6 and six against an 8-4 and four San Diego State squad that was playing on their home turf at Jack Murphy Stadium, or I think it was then. Was it still Qualcomm? It might have been San Diego County Credit Union uh, bowl or whatever they whatever the name of the stadium was uh but they've since torn that down but Kyle Van Noy, like I said, single-handedly said, yeah, enough's enough. Because BYU was trailing 6-3 going into the fourth quarter. And BYU ends up putting together 20 points in that fourth quarter, 14 of them via Kyle Van Noy, and gets out of there with the victory. Just an incredible single performance for Kyle Van Noy. He, of course, I, I was reading up on the kind of the recap of this, and he mentioned here, quote, I wouldn't make I wouldn't make those plays if all 11 guys weren't doing what they were doing, Van Noy said. The ball just happened to land in my lap. You know what, Kyle? Yes, you have to have your teammates help you out. But for one guy, Kyle Van Noy just essentially had his own like gravity, it felt like. He had the ability to dominate games, unlike many football players I have ever seen at the collegiate level. And BYU was darn lucky to have that guy in a Cougar uniform. 
excuse me, and of course, uh, finishing out the 2012 season with uh, Flourish as they win 23 to six over San Diego State. Now we're going to talk about the 2013 season beginning tomorrow. Uh, BYU facing off against Virginia. Bronco Mendenhall facing off what was actually just a few years later his new program. He would move on to. We'll talk about that and obviously uh, the 2013 season. Has some highs, has some lows, and of course, we're going to discuss it all in coming days on the podcast. But and for today, that's going to do it for us. A big thank you once again for your guys' questions, your support. You guys are absolutely great. I cannot thank you guys enough for your support of this podcast. Thank you for making us your first listen today. Now go make your second listen. Our friends over at the Locked On Big 12 podcast. Get caught up on all the Big 12 news out there every single day with Josh Neighbors, wherever you get your podcasts. Also, you can check it out on YouTube. Until tomorrow, my friends, have a great rest of your day. This has been the Locked on Cougars podcast. See ya.